Justin Glenn, I'm from DDN. This is the last presentation before lunch. I'm going to be joined by Daniel Richards, who's our Asia Pacific uh, Systems Engineer, and I'm talking about burst buffer. Uh, a quick introductory slide. Um, we'll, we're going to be talking about burst buffer, uh, what it's used for, and uh, then Daniel's going to talk a bit about a couple of benchmarks and where we've seen it deployed in this region. Uh, I've not used the traditional uh, DDN uh, corporate slide about uh, where we are at, but uh, DDN is a privately owned uh, company, a uh, storage company. In fact, we're the largest privately owned storage company in the world. Uh, on the totem pole of storage only companies, think of um, NetApp and HDS uh, at the top, and then we would be number three in terms of storage only. It used to be EMC, but of course they've been procured by uh, Dell. Uh, there is a list in the US which is called the Unicorn List. I don't know whether I like the name particularly, but it's a list of uh, startup companies that are tracked by the financial community in the US. And uh, on that list is, um, uh, DDN has just made the list, which means that you have to be valued at a billion dollars or more. Uh, and DDN's owned by two individuals who own about 95% of the company between the two of them, both um, very involved in the business. Uh, it doesn't really matter to you what the worth is of DDN, uh, except for one thing. You know that the HPC market is quite volatile, and we have seen this year Intel announced that they've, um, they're not continuing with IEEL anymore. It's going back to community luster. And last week we saw Seagate announce that they are discontinuing their specialised storage for the HPC marketplace. So uh, the thing about DDN is that we, even though we appear on this startup list with uh, Dropbox and others, uh, we're not really a startup. We, we got started 19 years ago. And we don't have any debt. There is no equity uh, in the sense that we haven't borrowed money to uh, grow the company, so we've grown by uh, organically. So there's been no acquisitions, we've not acquired anything significant, we've just uh, kept pace with the, and grown slightly faster than the market that we're in. So that really means we're in here for the long haul, and because we're mostly dedicated to the HPC marketplace, as a company, we've worked out a business model and how to work in this environment, and consequently we're going to be here for the long haul. We do tend to work with uh, all the vendors in this room, um, so we design our products to be compatible with everyone. So when you talk to us, you know that regardless of what HPC system you put in, we're going to be compatible and we'll be able to work with them. When we get involved in an installation, the first thing we have to do is come on site and do a test. And we want to test and prove the performance of our systems. I will quote you a 30 gigabyte per second system, so we want to come on site and uh, confirm that that is the case. So we do so, and when we run our benchmarks, they're perfectly aligned for a parallel file system for our storage. All the data is nicely aligned, we stream, we get the highest possible performance that you could expect. Uh, and then when we, when we finish the acceptance tests and the system goes into production, this is what happens. Uh, and you, you know that uh, applications aren't going to behave the way you would expect. You've got a large number of disparate types of users. Uh, they're all running code in different ways. The I.O. is never aligned the way you want it. And so you're never going to achieve the peak performance of your file system, of your storage system ever. So um, in, that, in this environment where you've got chaos, effectively, uh, cache is the best way to handle that in terms of I.O. And um, if I take a look at I.O. from uh, a classic customer we have, this doesn't come from Australia, this is an overseas customer. This is coming from a university customer where they profile their I.O. They're in a multidisciplinary environment. And the two things to notice about this is that firstly, most of the I.O. is writes as opposed to reads. And the second thing is that those rights are small rights. 
they're not big streaming rights, which is what a parallel file system uh, does and handles very well. There are a large number of small rights. Uh, and that's why DDN originally, uh, and we still do, uh, do an old-fashioned, relatively old-fashioned thing, as we design, we put, we put uh, cache, mirrored uh, write cache into our controllers because we, 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 we're a hardware RAID company. So, and it has to be battery backed, of course, if you're going to put in write cache into your controllers. So as a minimum, we, we recommend that you put in controllers into your system that have uh, battery backed mirrored write cache. So in other words, we, we put cache into our controllers. Uh, but if you agree that cache is, and cache is our friend in a, write, in a heavy write environment and in a small I.O. environment. So if you all agree with me that we want to have cache, the question is where in your workflow do you put the cache? And in principle, the closer you put the cache to the CPU, so cache I'm talking about uh, you know, SSDs or NVMe in particular, which is what we use, the closer you put it to the CPU, the, uh, the cheaper it's going to be and probably the better bang for buck you're going to get. But it's more difficult to use, you may have to change your code, and you can't share it. Meaning only that node can see it, really. You can buy some expensive software to try and glue it together. The, uh, at the other extreme, take the cache, let's put the NVMe down into the file system. It's going to be more expensive when you do that. Uh, and, but it's going to be easily shared, you'll make good use of it, but you're probably not going to get very good performance. Because we can show you plenty of instances where you take out the slow disk out of a file system and put in very fast disk into the same file system and there's no change in performance. And some of you have probably experienced that. So our thesis is that you, you wedge in the burst buffer in between the compute and your parallel file system. And that is physically, that's a box. It's an Intel box from us. Uh, we call it IME, but it's, physically it's a box and it has, it, it's full of NVMe. And that becomes your burst buffer. So then in this example, uh, we've got a compute cluster which uh, on the, the right-hand side is talking to a parallel file system. That's the traditional uh, way that most of you do your uh, run, run HPC. And we've got a particularly nasty application which is a, uh, a fluid dynamics, S3D, turbulent flow model. And it's writing into the parallel file system. This parallel file system is, is capable of four gigabytes per second. But when the, when the cluster writes directly into the parallel file system, it's getting a couple of orders of magnitude less performance, 25 megabytes per, per second performance, which is, which is poor. If we put in a burst buffer, and our implementation is called IME, uh, if we put that in there, then the compute cluster is talking to IME at 50 gigabytes per second, and then it, in turn, is dribbling the data back out into the parallel file system at 4 gigabytes per second. So in that instance, it wouldn't matter whether we had NVMe stacked inside the parallel file system. You're not going to get any difference in performance. So. Uh, NV, uh, so really, burst buffer, it's, it's less about the hardware. Sure, you've got to have the hardware there, but really the smarts are in the software and in that software layer. And um, it was originally used for checkpoint restart. But now we've designed a product that does the checkpoint restart, but then we've extended it and it does a whole lot of other things. So the question is, if you, if you agree that you need to have a burst buffer, and what we've seen is that in this region, most large systems in the top 100 are being built with burst buffers. Uh, if you need one, how do you size it? And here are some rough guidelines. So the bandwidth of a burst buffer should normally be three to five times the back end bandwidth. So if you've got a parallel file system at 30 gigabytes per second, then you'd expect burst buffer to be around about 100 gigabytes per second Maybe, maybe 150 gigabytes per second. Um, 
the aggregate capacity of the burst buffer, the NVMe, should be about a half to three times the aggregate capacity, memory capacity of the cluster. So you add up all of the memory on all the nodes, multiply that by 0.5 or more, and that's how much you should have in your burst buffer. That's so that you can do a checkpoint restart at least. Um, and Daniel goes through a couple of examples. The, the last thing is that this is not um, a little bit of a, a trivial bit of investment on the side. We're not seeing customers spend an extra one or two percent on their storage so to get a bit of burst buffer. This is a significant shift because what customers can do finally, what our customers can do is separate capacity in the parallel file system for performance. So they make their buy bigger spindles, make the performance in the parallel file system a bit less, lower, the, lower that cost and then push some of that investment into a burst buffer to increase the for, for performance. So separating the uh, separating performance and capacity. Uh, Daniel would like to talk through a couple of examples that we've got locally. Thank you. Cool. Um, I will talk about uh, three of the regional deployments we have with IME and a couple of slides around performance. Um, so two of the three deployments I've been directly involved in, uh, the other one not at all. So the first deployment is at uh, ASTAR in Singapore. This is a, a John talked in passing about ASTAR yesterday. Uh, so this was deployed maybe 18 months ago uh, and uh, the tender requirements were quite prescriptive. Um, the burst buffer layer, the capacity uh, requirement was stated as a ratio of the aggregate memory of the compute cluster. The compute cluster is around a petaflop of Xeon based compute um, with an EDR interconnect. Uh, they specified the cap uh, capacity and 500 gigabytes per second of performance from the burst buffer layer. Uh, to achieve that we used 10 IME 14K appliances. Each one of those appliances is two IME nodes with 24 IME devices. Um, and then uh, sitting behind that, uh, and uh, uh, Justin mentioned the architecture, is, is uh, a, a what we call a, a, a backing a file system. In this case, we're using Lustre. So we support, at the moment, Lustre and Spectrum Scale as the backing file systems. And the uh, performance of the backing file system was also stated as a uh, percentage of burst buffer. So they wanted it to be a 30% burst buffer. So we've got around 150 gigabytes a second of luster um, that we achieve with uh, SFA 12Ks. Um, and then uh, sitting behind that we have um, some grid scale or spectrum cell based storage for home and applications and trickling into a object store for HSM. Uh, so we've kind of got the full set uh, from a DDM perspective. Um, the a second um, implementation, uh, so this is uh, a tender that we've just responded to uh, and been successful. Uh, this will be installed at the end of this year. Uh, so again, quite prescriptive around the requirements. They stated a burst buffer layer, uh, a backing uh, a luster parallel file system, uh, and a test system. So here uh, we've got a uh, Knight's Landing based compute. Um, we've got an OPA interconnect. Uh, the uh, burst buffer is 800 gigabytes a second and 800 terabytes of capacity. And we're using slightly different hardware. Um, uh, for this solution we're using um, IME uh, 240s, which are a, a slightly more uh, granular system. And I guess, as Justin alluded to, it's, it's really about the software much more than the hardware. The, the, uh, we're, uh, really what we're looking for the hardware to do is to deliver the NVMe capacity and the NVMe uh, uh, raw bandwidth as uh, cost efficiently as possible. Uh, really the software is doing all the smarts around that. Uh, so each of the IME 240s is a 2U dual socket uh, uh, system that can take up to 23 NVMe devices. Yeah, so we can play with a number of NVMe devices 
uh, in terms of bandwidth and also in terms of capacity. And we have two network ports coming out of the back, OPA or EDR at the moment. Um, and then uh, the file system behind that, we've got nine um, SFA 14K uh, Lustre appliances uh, delivering around 300 gigabytes a second and 15 petabytes of usable capacity. And then obviously some metadata, uh, separate home and apps, and a test bed system. Um, it's uh, interesting to note for this tender that um, uh, working with the compute vendors, um, the uh, compute vendors spend a lot of time hunting for uh, the most uh, cost-effective way to meet the requirements of the tender. You know, so so that, that really put a lot more work on us from a benchmarking perspective. You know, we had uh, KNL-based clients, we had potentially Xeon-based clients, uh, EDR and OPA Interconnect. You know, so we had four combinations of benchmarks we had to do. Uh, so a lot more work for us. Uh, and for me, I think the most interesting outcome around that was um, uh, K&L, at least at this point, um, uh, I guess not surprisingly, a, uh, a much lower single thread performance uh, than we get out of Xeon. Um, by. And then a system uh, that went into uh, Japan and was commissioned at the end of last year, um, at the Joint Center for Advanced uh, High Performance Computing. Um, so again, a large uh, night's landing system, uh, 25 petaflops, uh, OPA, uh, delivering uh, approximately 1.5 terabytes a second from the burst buffer layer. Uh, this uses um, the IME 14K appliances um, and has a 400 gigabyte uh, luster file system sitting behind it. So again, as uh, uh, Justin mentioned, we uh, sort of maintaining a ratio somewhere between three and five to one in terms of the uh, burst buffer layer performance and the backing parallel file system. And uh, as Justin alluded to, uh, we can, uh, in terms of fulfilling both the performance and the capacity requirements, we can uh, configure both of those separately. Uh, so just a couple of slides on performance. Uh, so this slide came from the DDN user group presentation at this year's ISC, and this is part of an overall uh, brain simulation uh, project. Um, I hope you can't see the scale too much on the, uh, the vertical axis there. I'm not sure what's going on, to be honest, with the vertical scale. Um, but on the, on, on the left, we've got the IME results, and on the right, we've got the uh, writing directly to Lustre, in this case, results. The dotted lines are a benchmark simulation of the load. The solid line is the actual workload. Um, uh, without getting too wrapped up in the uh, actual numbers, um, uh, what we see here is uh, linear scaling, or uh, uh, more or less linear scaling, as we add more uh, threads with IME uh, and um, I, I guess uh, very poor scaling with, with Lustre and this application is a large shared file write. Um, as Justin talked about, um, one of the things that IME is particularly good for is shared file write and I guess particularly compared with a parallel file system that is poor for shared file write. Um, and um, our old friend WRF uh, that we all seem to be talking about. Uh, so this was actually run on the A-Star machine. Um, so, so we ran um, uh, 48 uh, concurrent uh, simulations across 240 compute nodes. Uh, this is the uh, last, uh, this is the IME um, at workload pattern, and you can see the bandwidth got us to 390 gigabytes a second against the theoretical. Uh, 500 gigabytes a second from the benchmark. If you go back to uh, Justin's puppy slides, you know, so, so we can get under ideal conditions from the burst buffer layer at A-star about 500 gigabytes. This application we've got 390 gigabytes, so around 80% of the uh, theoretical bandwidth. Running on the uh, director luster, which, which had the theoretical uh, peak of around 300 gigabytes, uh, we could only get 100 gigabytes a second out of it. Uh, 
so around 30% of the uh, realised uh, bandwidth. Yeah. So that's the, uh, the, the uh, storage or the I.O. picture, I guess. Uh, ultimately, we care about application execution time. And uh, this is uh, mapping the, uh, the I.O. Uh, against the application uh, execution time. The I.O. is at the top. Uh, the direct cluster is at the bottom. Uh, the horizontal scales are different, um, but the uh, dotted lines show the equivalent application execution time uh, between um, uh, direct to luster and IME, and running it uh, on IME, we've got a one and a half times speed up of the application runtime. Uh, I guess uh, performance is. Uh, there's more to it than just raw performance. You know, there's uh, one of the things with IME we get is uh, repeatable execution times. You know, so, so how long will the application take to run? Um, and this is an example of, of that same simulation uh, running those same jobs, uh, uh, running the same jobs uh, 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 20 times. So the red bar is the IME result. And across those 20 jobs, we had a four-second variance in the execution times. Uh, running it to luster, the same number of jobs, uh, we had a, a, a variance of more than 30 seconds across the jobs. Uh, yes, so as, as the jobs get larger and um, uh, busier, the uh, execution time with IME stays consistent and predictable, and with the parallel file system, not so much. And that is my last slide. Um, so, I'm happy to take questions or happy to discuss this more outside of the lunch. I don't know the answer to that question. I would assume not, because I guess we're writing into NVMe that's already powered up. So I wouldn't imagine there'd be much difference between the idle uh, power of the devices and I guess the nominal. But I don't know. I could check that. Indeed. Well, thank you.